So first off, you know, I just want to give a huge thank you for Leanne for coming out tonight. Uh, she's busy. She's a VP of marketing for Dot Form. If you guys didn't know, that's be why you're here. Uh, and she's been crushing in marketing for almost, I believe, like several years for them. Almost several years. And uh, if you don't know, Dot Form is one of the coolest companies because they're basically like the only alternative, or well, only like good alternative to like Google Forms. So when I first came across Dot Form, I was like, oh my god, like there's actually something else. <laughs> And then I started seeing a lot of my friends use job form and they were just like posting these links as these beautiful forms that I've never seen anything like it. And I was like, oh, I gotta get a hold of somebody from this company and actually bring them in here because I just found it like this very unique solution to this big problem that so many people have because we all use forms at some point. Um, and that's why I was here today. So thank you for being here. Thanks Josh for having me. So we're gonna go ahead and get started, and I, one of the first things I like to dive into is a uh, story, and that story of how you got started into marketing. And this tends to range from uh, everybody from, I started in marketing when I was 10 years old, selling stuff at school all the way till, you know, I didn't know until my startup failed. <laughs> so uh, tell, take us back to aha moment of how you got involved in the startup marketing world, and uh, yeah, walk us through your journey. Sure. So. My first foray into marketing was an internship in college where I interned for BB Corporate and it was a competitive um, internship where two students from each state in the US would compete against each other. And we would, it was one school year, I was a sophomore in college and um, we were given a budget of zero to start and then depending on the results that we got, we got more and more funding. So it was really a challenge of how much sales can we drive that were all tracked um, based on just grassroots marketing efforts. And then um, where I feel like I really got into marketing though was after college, I worked at a marketing agency in Boston where the target market was the millennial market and that was super exciting because I was in my early 20s and our niche market that we were targeting were also early 20-somethings primarily. So we were able to really tackle social media marketing and other types of affiliate marketing at really the cusp of when that changed. So in the very beginning, like, you know, social media marketing wasn't really a huge thing, or if it was, it was like, post on Facebook once a day and that's your marketing strategy. So we kind of transformed that a little bit. We were a little bit early. So I really got excited and really into marketing when I put on a passion project, as I like to say, um, and it was to start my company's Pinterest page. And because our target market was primarily college students and younger individuals, um, the Pinterest was really focused on that demographic. And myself and my amazing and inspirational um, manager at the time, Julie, we together um, did a lot of non-technical hacking as far as marketing went. And we found ways in, for example, Pinterest algorithm to enhance our reach and to gain the followers without you know, basically just using the product in a way that maybe they didn't even think about. Um, we did things like, so Pinterest at the time would recommend users. You'd, you'd sign up for Pinterest and then you'd get an email and then you would have to follow, say, five to 10 accounts before you'd be allowed to be a user. So we actually were able to get our company's Pinterest page emailed to millions of people and got recommended to them. And the way that we did that was through timing and through really strategic pinning and also reaching out to the community and forming different groups. So because the algorithm is always changing, it started for me with social media marketing because it was always fresh and exciting and sometimes you felt like you were doing something brand new that there wasn't really a lot of literature out there about and that's what kind of got me into marketing. So you start off with like this big win, and then you get more involved in startups. And one of the things that um, I find very interesting about marketing for early stage startups is that it is almost like the worst position to be in because if the product is really bad, they're still going to blame you anyways. <laughs> yeah. And you're taking on this big risk. So they're like, oh gosh, who is, why you know, don't we have enough users? It must be the marketer's fault. So when you go and work for an early stage startup, um, you have to be willing to actually like stand up to the CEO and be like, hey guys, we actually have to improve the product. <laughs> and it's not just me not being able to acquire users. So tell us about you know, what was your decision like jumping into the job form and saying, hey, I'm gonna join this company early on and even though they're not the most well-known company yet, um, I'm gonna take that risk. 
So when I started at Job Farm almost three years ago, I was the first marketing hire, and my coworker Chad was the second marketing hire, pretty pretty close after me. So we were able to completely, like, Job Farm was founded in 2006 and was a profitable SaaS company, and they were lucky enough. It was a combination of luck and really great timing and having a great product, but they were able to acquire over a million and a half users pretty organically. So when I started, it was such an exciting challenge to be able to build a profitable SaaS company's marketing strategy from the ground up. And that was everything from setting up all the different marketing processes that a company would need. So just the challenge is really exciting. Like it, it doesn't really, the opportunity doesn't come around that often to be the first to be able to make that kind of large impact from the get-go. So that's why I was super excited into diving in and seeing what was gonna happen. So one of the things that I think is very interesting about Jotform is it has great product market fit. And you said a number of its users were acquired organically. And that means that usually the product has nice like referral loops mm -hmm. where if someone uses it, um, they're more likely to refer somebody else. And uh, there's a streamlined process for that. So can you talk a little bit about how you get Jotform users to refer other users? Sure. So prior to Jotform having a marketing team, the way that they acquired users somewhat organically was that Jotform was the first WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get online form builder. And because it was the first at a time where companies needed this sort of data collection via forms, and at the time, developers were actually coding out these forms from scratch. It was labor intensive, it was expensive, it took a lot of time even to code out a contact form that was right for your business. And you can even imagine a registration form that was custom and had a lot of different form fields. It was just, it, it just didn't work. So our CEO in 2006 actually came across this problem in his own personal life as he was a developer and then created job form as a side project and it grew. And so when I came on board to start the marketing team, um, we implemented viral loops pretty recently actually. So job form in its lifespan did not have the viral loops until pretty recently. So online forms is naturally a viral product because someone who creates a form needs respond, people to respond to the form, so they're sending them out either on their website, as a standalone form, via email, social, all these different channels. So we basically just capitalized on the fact that the product itself was a self-perpetuating product, and we added things like in the form itself, there's, there's now a little bit of branding. Um, when the form is submitted, there's also branding. So we have been tracking what kind of signups are occurring from those links. And actually what we found was that the signups that we were getting through organic channels, people were searching for an online form builder. They were searching for the solution to their needs, whether they need an application form, registration form, payment form, anything like that. So the people that are searching for this via Google or whatever, they're, as you can imagine, higher quality leads. And those people that are actively searching for our product are more likely to become an active user. They're more likely to be a paid user. Um, and they are of higher quality. However, we have experienced a lot of success with our viral loop because, for one thing, it is difficult to track brand awareness. If someone is filling out a few job form forms when they need an online form product, they might think about job form. And also, we've been tracking the signups that occur from the product itself. And those signups are still strong. They're not as strong as people who are actively looking for a product, but they're good signups and we do have sizable amount becoming active and becoming paid. So definitely implementing that viral process in our forums um, was great for us. So you're building out this uh, viral loop process and at the same time, like you have to keep in mind like your value proposition. So one of the things that I find fascinating about young startups is they'll have their value prop and then they'll start adding like more benefits on because they're like, oh, this is what the customer wants, right? This is what the customer wants. And all of a sudden they're offering like seven or 10 different benefits and their value prop, they haven't really focused on it in a while. So if you had to say like, job form, does this one thing better than um, every other form builder out there? And this is what we put at the forefront, what would that be? So job form is the easiest form builder. That's our tagline and our intuitive interface is definitely very easy to use. It actually kind of walks you through the process. So you don't have to be, there's definitely this trend nowadays of non-technical users want to be able to get things done without having to rely on 
a developer to do like a small task for them, like create a form. So Job Farm is the solution to that problem. Anybody, a teacher, someone in operations, someone in marketing, whoever, can create a data collection process that's completely customized to their, their company. You can upload company branding, you can get really specific. We have over 100 integrations with business tools. So anybody without any kind of prior knowledge can log on to Job Form right now and have a form online up and running in a matter of a minute. And it can be very powerful due to all of our integrations that we have. So it's it's really just kind of uh, just out there and, and easy to use is our, our main selling point. Yeah, I think you know when you do see a job form, it looks super slick and it just makes you feel like it's really easy to set up and use. And I think that was one of the reasons that I really loved it. Um, and one of the things I'm interested in is because you are the VP of marketing and you have to build out a marketing team, but it's also like there's a lot of complications that come with that depending on the product. So you do have a product with great product market fit, a lot of organic uh, referrals coming in. So how do you hold people accountable? So you're looking at KPIs, do you say, if we need this many leads every week or every month? Um, and how do you structure your team? So we have some idea. Our team is highly collaborative. Um, we work together on almost everything. As far as specific goal setting, we every single day we look at subscription cancellations, we know how many users we have, we have a pulse on how many signups we're getting, and in the past about three years we've dramatically increased not only signups but paid users, and paid users is really a very important KPI, like paid and active users, because it really doesn't matter you know, we all, if we all like sign up for a bunch of products, maybe you want to just check it out. Um, but if we're not actually using it, and it's not important to us, that user just doesn't have that same value. So active users is definitely our main KPI. KPI. I find like really fascinating because like, I ask this question a lot and many like teams actually just focus on like pumping up like free trial numbers, whatever it may be. But it is, that is the most important number. Like in my opinion, it's focusing on active customers because if you don't have active customers, you have nothing. Um, so that's really cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, explain to me a little bit like so how your startup has grown and some of the little roadblocks that you've seen um, and that you guys overcame uh, regarding the product and regarding marketing. So were there times where you're like, okay, we have to implement a whole new analytics system and stuff like that? So our biggest roadblock and I think our biggest challenge when I first came on board was the fact that our homepage wasn't really a homepage. And this is, you know, for a B2B SaaS product, um, nowadays, it kind of looks like all the home pages look the same. If you look at so many B2B products, it's like, okay, really clean, uh, similar design, that kind of thing. So we actually held on, in my opinion, a little bit too long of not having a home page. So our home page at the time was actually the interface of the product. And so coming in, I knew instantly, I want to change this home page. This home page should be so much better. And not only that, but uh, we are very design focused, just us people. Um, when we have, now, now that the online form space is a little bit more crowded than it was when we were the only one, we can no longer rely on the strength of the product alone to get the users. So revamping the homepage was a really long process because the kind of testing that we did, we did so much testing. We looked at you know, the length of the homepage, what really makes a difference, um, and just, just give you an idea, some things we found was um, if it's too long, people are just not going to see this up at the bottom. Uh, we did some heat mapping, we saw where people were clicking. People were really clicking towards the front, like towards the top part above the fold was really important. Um, so we tested a lot of different versions and we found that the simple approach works the best. So when we finally did implement the home page, uh, we ran some tests at first to even determine if we needed to revamp the homepage. And one way we did that was AdWords. Um, we just tested the homepage that we currently have, uh, the one that we had for a few years that came in and that was the homepage. We tested what the sign-up numbers were compared to a sign-up page. If there's a specific call to action and they're, they're asked to do one specific thing and they're not distracted by the interface that had so many buttons and it maybe was confusing for a lot of users, we actually found that it had close to four times more signups if we just implemented a really simple, this was just a test. Um, so because we had such really strong results, uh, we knew instantly we need a homepage. We're just losing the opportunity cost of not having a homepage. We're just like losing all those potential signups. 
So we we had our designers like put together different versions, um, you know, like, and it was a lot of branding issues came up as well. It was, you know, what colors do we like? What do we want to represent? Um, we're B2B, B2B online forms product, so it is inherently not the most exciting tool imaginable, but thanks to our design team, um, our head of design, Jen, actually came up with a fun mascot, cartoon cat, we have a name and everything, um, but it, it went beyond that. It, it, went, it went to, we want to convey fun, we want to convey easy, so we really revamped it into something that's, that screamed accessible, versus people being intimidated by seeing an entire interface of a software that they didn't know how to use, and at the time we were building ourselves as the easiest form builder, yet it looked intimidating. So we, we changed that, and then we saw a lot of success from that. And then it just increased our signups, it, it really became more geared towards the users that we were trying to attract, which was primarily non-technical users. Wow, that's that would be crazy if you're a marketer that comes on and you're like, this is how I can 4x your signups, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that barely ever happens. Uh, yeah, congratulations on that. That's a big win. Thanks. So I'm really interested um, in your attribution system. So we talked about this a little bit before, but I just want you to like dive into it and talk about how you understand where your customers are coming from, right? And it is hard for products to have great product market fit. Some products like uh, Zapier or Mixmax. Um, have no idea. Like I've interviewed both of them, and they're like, "Yeah, we have no idea. We just know that we create cross market fit." <laughs> I'm like, "Okay, I guess that works." Um, so I want you to talk about how you deal with that process. So one of our challenges is actually marketing for our user base because online forms that really spans all roles, all industries. It's a challenge because we're not a niche product, which. In each product, you know you know exactly who you're trying to target, and all of your efforts go into that one segment. But with Job Form, we had teachers using the product to make quizzes, homework quizzes for their students. We had marketers using our product to create lead generation forms. We had people in HR making custom job application forms. It was really all over the map, all different industries. You know, bakeries making custom order forms. It was just a lot to tackle with one company's marketing messaging. So that was our big challenge. And um, our CEO, Ida Kintank, his aspiration to us is that we want to be the Excel of online forms. So with that, we feel like online forms should be for everyone. You know, it's 2017, we're no longer using paper forms, it's just not efficient, everything is done online, even e-signatures, all that kind of stuff. And that can all be done with a form. So our challenge was to make the messaging of job form compelling across all industries and across all roles. So we did that by revamping all of the in-product messaging and the messaging on our website to start with. The messaging was a little bit too technical in the beginning because it kind of goes back to the history of job form created by a developer we were very engineering heavy. And in the beginning it was a little bit <laughs> it was a little bit assumed. It was a little bit assumed that job form was used for developers because developers would code out their form, and then perhaps they would use job form to make, basically make that process faster. So with the website and the messaging that we had, it was, it was technical, it was talking about our custom CSS features, something that people find useful, but uh, the, the average job form user is not coding. So making the messaging fit the big group as a whole was really important to narrow that down. We don't want to market to a small segment. We want to talk in a language that everybody can understand. So what's really interesting about this is I was talking to the head of growth of uh, Pandoc, and he said, hey, we get so many free trial users, but the problem is, is that when we look at like who our best free trial users are that become customers, uh, it's a very small segment because they have, uh, they're, I'll give you an example. The people that use them the most are people that are about to get divorced and they need documents. But they're only using it one time. And he says, we get tons and tons of these people, but like we can't stand them. <laughs> so tell us about like who is your target customer and you could be like, these guys who use us are the best. Um, then you have like this whole other market, right? Um, and some people that you could use you guys maybe just one time. So our power users have hundreds of forms. And some of their forms have they can have hundreds of form fields. 
So there is so much data that they have invested in our product and they put so much work into creating the custom forums, like writing in exactly what they wanted for, for everything. And the time invested into that means that they'll probably stick with us and their churn will be lower. So our ideal customer is someone that uses Dropform heavily, uses Dropform every day. It's really integrated in their company. People use it across teams. So we definitely want to increase the engagement because we've found that really engaged users who use Dropform every day in their daily workflow are gonna be the users that stick around year after year because it's already embedded into their company. It's kind of like Salesforce. Once your whole company is set up with Salesforce, you're probably gonna stick with them. So once a whole company is, is with Jotform, they're the ones that we would ideally want because they're gonna stay. Cool, and one of the things I'm really interested in is like who are the people like on your team, well not specifically on the marketing team, but are really like leading the company with its visions? Because it's not always a CEO, sometimes it's a CTO. Um, and tell us about like what he has in store for the company in the next like year or two. Sure, so what's really great about Jotform is that our CEO, Ida King, gives everyone the ability to be managers. So everybody in the company has their voice heard. Everybody, at some point or another, has come up with an idea. And they might pitch it to their coworkers, whoever's sitting next to them. Uh, they may draft up the specs. And then, depending on what the company consensus is, we'll put it, we'll put it together. We use Trello pretty heavily. So we're always kind of on pace with what people's ideas are. We have an up next section of projects that you know we're gonna start you know moving forward with. And we also have different ideas that maybe their priority level isn't this week, this month, but all these ideas are stored and are accessible to everybody in the company. So I think that kind of transparency is really important and everyone feels like their ideas are about like good ideas come from everybody. So there isn't necessarily like one or two people owning the idea generation process. It's really like an entire team effort. And I really recommend some sort of project management and software like Trello so everybody can kind of see and it's kind of like an equal playing field for ideas. So you just mentioned Trello and you mentioned Salesforce. Like what are some of the other products? Like I don't even know if you use Salesforce, but like what are some of the other products that you guys use uh, that you think like gives you guys a competitive edge? So if you have a list, maybe like five of them. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so um, obvious choice, we use Google Docs for everything. Uh, we share a lot. Um, we use Slack for everything, discussions, file uploads. Um, we're often like working on a doc simultaneously and then specking things out, that kind of thing. Um, one thing that I would recommend is user testing, which is now changes name to Upwork, I believe. They're really great for having people kind of like a, a third, kind of, kind of a different perspective because when you're working on your product all the time, you become so familiar with it. It's using a tool, using an outside tool where you can get fresh eyeballs on it can kind of discover bugs or kinks that like you may not have seen yourself. Um, we also, we love Trello. Um, actually, a lot of our, our integrations we use ourselves. Um, we actually use Jotform a lot internally, which is great because it allows us to really get to know our product. But we use Jotform for everything. Like when we had a, we had a product launch party in February for Jotform 4.0 and our invitations were all sent out through Jotform. Um, for partnership forms, any kind of data collection, even when we want to vote on the name of our company mascot, survey through Jotform. So we really, it, it's really embedded into our company day to day. Now one of the interesting things I find about your story is that because you started uh, marketing with them around three years ago, that's around the time that like growth started becoming sort of popular. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know how did that affect your role as a VP of marketing? Um, did it affect it at all, and or were they like, "Hey, we got to implement like growth frameworks now"? Was there ever, ever a time like that? So I I feel like my company traditionally approaches growth with more of a practical stance. So we don't typically use too many buzzwords in the office because you know, like we work really closely with our development team and our design team, and we all communicate together in a language that we can all understand. I think it's really important for company-wide, everyone to be on the same page. Um, you know, no need to throw a, you know, around like ARPU and, and all these languages that not every team is like really fit into their workflow. So yeah, we, we just kind of, um, like as far as growth, I wouldn't say that we do 
we try to go after growth hacking I, or anything like that, but it just comes about some of our projects could be considered growth hacking, like implementing the viral loop into our in product and, and things like that. Um, but we don't actively try to necessarily ride those trends. That makes sense. Um, and I want to dive a little bit into like how you guys use content marketing and uh, what is your guys' play there? Where do you see like the future of content marketing going? As there's been so much, uh, I would say like this whole way of going to Facebook and like moving off of Twitter, moving off of other social channels, and everybody's like doubling down on Facebook, even for like B two B marketing. So mm -hmm. I just want to hear your ideas on it. Go for it. So we do a lot of content marketing, and the B two B content marketing space is very crowded. And another thing is, not everybody wants to read a ton of content about online forms. So we are faced with a challenge of making it creative and making it really useful for people. So, you know, as far as SEO and a lot of the content marketing purpose is for SEO, we definitely do not want to play like the content marketing game of just writing articles strictly for SEO. We want to add value to our users. And, you know, what's really important to us is engagement. So with our blog posts, we look to see like what are the what are the comments that we're getting, like what are our users saying? We actually, because it's not just for SEO and is primarily geared towards our users, we even have things that we call internally a MyForm Scanner, which is basically in-product messaging, driving people to the freshest content on our blog. So we get a lot of traffic that way. As far as content marketing, we do work with a PR firm. We do a lot of thought leadership. Um, our, our CEO, Ida Tank, he actually is a writer for Entrepreneur, and then he really you know, as kind of an engineering background, he really loves content marketing. So I think that that culture has sort of come to all of us. Um, a few years back, we started a company effort of writing on Medium. And Medium was kind of, uh, kind of in the early stages. Now there's more and more companies that are using it. But we, we kind of used it for fun and also to connect with other companies. And we also thought that it was nice for our users so that they could hear from individuals that work at Job Farm. We have a newsletter, and, and people like to see, you know, what it's like uh, as a designer at Job Forum, or a developer, or a marketer. So our content comes from everybody in our company that's in charge of write, and we also do a lot of content on uh, the marketing team. So as far as content marketing, our strategy is really like thought leadership, but also like making our product interesting. So instead of talking about online forums <coughs> week after week, nobody would tune in at all. We talk about ways for, for example, HR professionals the forms that they need to get their job done. Whether it be onboarding forms, you know, what happens when you hire someone new? How do you, how do you like onboard them into the company? How do you know like what kind of laptop they prefer? Any of these like these tangible items that can all, all that data can be collected with forms. So our content is really geared towards so many of the different segments that may have a use for our product. So I want to dive into a couple of projects you're working on right now in the company. So if you could tell us a little bit about that, unless it's like super top secret stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to. So our more recent development is the launch of Job Farm 4.0, which was just launched on February 1st. So we're still riding that wave of, we have now onboarded all of our users to this brand new platform. And so Job Farm 4.0 is the first and currently the only full featured online forms product to be 100% mobile friendly. So we felt like it's now or never with this whole mobile thing. And not only do the forms look great on mobile, but people are working remotely now. People want to you know, go on vacation and be able to work. People want to be at the park and work outside. Um, and people want to be able to collaborate with remote teams around the world. So this revamped version of our product right now allows that to happen. So you can actually work on building out forms or looking at your data at your desk. You can continue working on it on your phone on the way to the train. Even when you're in the train, even if you were with service, you continue working on it because we have offline capability. And once you get Wi-Fi again, it'll all sync and you can just continue that workflow. So we really want to make it revolutionary and really easy for everybody to use up online forms wherever in the world they may be, whether their Wi-Fi is spotty or not. We just want to make this we want to really live up to our name of Job Farm, the easiest form builder. I love it. I think that's so cool how you're like just doubling down on your value prop. I think that's so important. Uh, so I have like one more question before we just like jump into the audience to ask them questions, uh, which is how do you keep up with marketing? So do you read 
tons of different blogs, like who do you follow, and maybe you don't read blogs at all, and just test out different pieces of software. Like everybody's different, and some people just listen to podcasts all day long, right? Mm -hmm. um, so talk about where you get your news to stay up to date. So I am a daily medium uh, reader, as I mentioned, I really like medium. Um, and I think it's cool to learn from other people in the Bay Area that are, you know, working on similar products and what they're doing for marketing. Because I think, you know, we're in San Francisco, we're in the tech space, whatever's happening, like it's happening here, and it's really great to hear from our peers um, what people are doing at their company. And it's also, I think, a lot of word of mouth, like talking to people. Um, I'm not a big podcast person, personally. Um, I do occasionally read some marketing blogs, but I really think the best way to do it is just to read up on what's going on and just to just get a, a pulse on things. Cool, awesome. Um, so if anybody has any questions, this would be the time to ask him. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Go for it. What do you think drove your 50% plus year over year revenue growth? What, what stages were that? Because you were already a product market fit company. How much revenue would be done generally, raise was, or round was, was the seven, and what's the size of your company? So we are a fully bootstrapped company. We've been profitable for many years now. So we haven't actually needed to raise any outside funding. So no, yeah, I was saying well, how, how much, like what drives the growth? What drove it? So one thing that was huge was the home just for signups. Um, we also did a big pricing change um, a couple years ago. And the pricing change really was a huge factor in the success. So every month we we deliver a newsletter to our users and it has what are the new features we have this month, what are the new integrations that we're giving you because we have continuous development, like we're always trying to get better and better. Um, however, our pricing was stagnant for a few years unfortunately. And um, you know, as a marketing team, it was it was necessary. We needed a change. We were devaluing ourselves. We had grown so much and our pricing was stagnant. And so it was actually a really exciting project for all of us to work on to change the pricing of our SaaS business. And it was a lot of factors. It was looking at not just our competitors, but just getting a pulse on, on how things are going. What was, what was the real value that we were giving to them? Um, how, you know, some of it was a little bit of psychology, like we didn't want to uh, devalue ourselves by being the 999 product or anything like that. Um, but we, we really looked into what, what was the, the, the perfect amount that people would pay at all the different price levels. Um, so our pricing change was huge, and we also did a marketing campaign that really, we had to basically, had the, we had to tell all of our users, hey, we're gonna raise all of our prices. So as you can imagine, that, that had the chance of not going well. <laughs> so, so what we did was we, just, we made the decision to grandfather in all of our users. We wanted to reward our loyal users. They, some of them have been us, with us for years. We're not going to, you know, they, they use the same product one day and the next day with the same product. Their price were going up. So all of our users were grandfathered in. And we did a campaign to encourage people to get on a paid plan. We are a freemium product, so if you have uh, pretty minor use, usage levels, you can remain free forever. We do not kick you off of any sort of free trial. But we did a campaign around encouraging those who are free to upgrade. And this was a limited, this was a very limited time offer because when we made the pricing change, that was it, we weren't gonna go back. So as far as the free users, if they were to upgrade and we gave them a window, they're able to remain on the original lower priced pricing plan forever, like as long as they wanted to, if they upgraded during that time frame. So a lot of people who were free and a lot of people who were paid that decided to move up on the paid plan, they, this marketing campaign was extremely effective because this really was their last chance. And so we had a ton of upgrades and we also had lower churn with those users because you know, if, if you downgrade and think, oh, I'll, I'll upgrade when I have a chance, you're gonna, you're not gonna have that discounted kind of rate. So that campaign was really successful for us. And as far as the brand new users that came on board, they just didn't know about the old pricing chain, and they only just saw the, the the new pricing page. So that was an issue for us. So we were able, and you know, it took it took a while for us to, you know, give people the window, give them all the messaging. But we actually didn't really experience any any real complaints about uh, pricing increase because we did it in that way. Um, did you coerce 
to look at that. I mean, you probably looked look at the data from the chalk form, or did you do outside testing? I mean, for the deciding, and, and for shoes, deciding what know. to put the new prices. Oh, it was really everything. Um, it was it was very cool because the CEO and everybody at the marketing team we hadn't had experience with changing the SaaS pricing model yet because that's something that being able to have the opportunity to make that change is a project that doesn't and shouldn't come around too often. So it was everything from we talked to experts. Uh, there's a software called Clarity that I'd recommend. You can. Um, kind of pay for consulting and you can really find the people who have experience with pricing um, and just kind of get that as a background. And we also uh, did quite a bit of testing on what people were more receptive to. What the conversion rates are on us or something like that. Yeah. Or through your own tool. Mm-hmm. You mentioned you had a bunch of users that were just like heavy users on the, on the upper end of your echelon. Uh, what do you think, was, besides the fact that they use more forms than the rest of you, what do you think differentiates them from the rest of your users? Like, it what do they know that they, the other people don't know? So we found that if you have at least if you have at least five forms, you're probably going to be a better user. And a lot of other software companies take this sort of thing into consideration. That's why when you sign up for Twitter, for instance, you have to follow a certain amount of people before you can be a user. Um, there's a lot of softwares like this. So social media is pretty key, but because forms are kind of a viral product, we found that once people hit like a minimum engagement level, they're more likely to stay. If someone signs up, has no activity on their dashboard, doesn't create one form, they're probably never going to be a user. So we can kind of predict who the, good, who the more valuable users are. If they sign up, they obviously have a purpose. They started using the product, they became active very soon. They perhaps became paid early on, um, so it was really, it's all about engagement for us. Uh, who did you choose, and like, what, why did those people engage more with you than, than the people who don't engage more? Because like everybody, like you said, everybody can use the form. Right. So like, I mean, like, if I use the form, and, uh, and Josh uses the form, but Josh uses like six forms, and I only use two. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you think is the key difference between, the, or at least that you guys have found, and the people or that they use more forms? I mean, they, is it an emphasis on productivity, or is it an like, uh, how, do you, how do you explain sort of the, the difference in your, in your customers? So the people that engage with us more have more of a use for our forms. So if you're an event planner and you're getting all these event registrations and you're using it to collect payments and you're using it to um, get client kind of communication on your website, if you're using it for you know, multi-purpose and you're using it a lot and you're say selling you know a couple hundred tickets a month, you're probably going to be a much more engaged user than, say, a college student that wants to use it um, to create a survey for one project that they're going to have and then never use it again. So engagement and like the value that we provide to the user is the same value that they give us. So it's people who have more of a need are going to be better users for us. Do you try to stimulate that engagement or do just do it themselves? We, we definitely try to simulate that kind of engagement. Um, user education is really important for JotForm because, as I mentioned earlier, there's so many use cases that a lot of people may not know that it could have this functionality. So one thing that we found, which was like a, a pretty valuable insight for us, was payments. Our users, even our users that have been with us for a long time, didn't know that we can collect payments and we do that with no additional processing fee. So a lot of people will you know, pay for competitors like Eventbrite that charges crazy fees and stuff like that, um, but they're just not aware. So a lot of our user education comes from messaging that kind of reminds people, hey, did you know that you can collect payments with JobFlight? Here's a case study on someone who um, you know, sells cupcakes at their bakery with job form. And here's, here's types of forms, and here are examples. We have a theme store where you can like look at examples where you can become familiar of, hey, maybe I need this use case. So user education is huge for us because it's gonna spur engagement, and it's gonna make people use the product more, which will make them churn less and uh, move up the ladder in their pricing. Go for it. Um, as a SaaS company, you are in a, a, a newish category of products 
that are pioneering some new techniques as to how to be successful and so on. Is where where's your community? Where is your tribe of other companies that are like you that you go and, and learn from? So we are pretty active with our partnerships because so one of the differentiators of Jot Farm versus other online form builders is that we have over a hundred integrations. Salesforce, Dropbox, Box, you name it, we have it. Um, our closest competitor, I believe, has maybe a dozen. So business integrations are a strong point. So as far as partnerships, we're very active with partnerships. Um, we do everything from co-marketing to doing an integration together, either we build them or they build them. Um, we can really, with partnerships, it's a great tool to tap into their user base. You know, they send all of all of their users an email, hey, we have a job integration. We do the same. So it's really a win-win, which is why having partnerships and having so many integrations with people that we work with has been really valuable for us. Do you have a dedicated business development person that focuses on that or is that your role? Um, if you're interested in partnerships, Chad here um, will be able to connect you and we can discuss things from co-marketing to integrations to any other kind of partnership. Go for it. Uh, cool. Um, my name's Lee. I just have a quick question. Earlier on, you mentioned that forms are inherently viral. I was hoping you could expand on that, specifically with regards to your viral coefficient. Like, what do you what do you observe, and how do you optimize it to you know, increase from say 1.5 to 2, 3? You know, so for every single customer you have, they have a form out there. How do you ensure that you can get additional customers, not necessarily users, but additional customers? from the each form of form that's published you know, to the public? Sure. So with the form, um, the paid versions of our product, um, they're able to be white labeled. So a job form, if you're a paid user, a job form form looks like your developers made it in-house. All your custom branding fits exactly with your website. You can do whatever you want with it as far as customization. But as far as free users, um, because they're using our product for free, it's pretty expected and it's pretty much the standard in the industry to have some slight branding and that's something that we have tested and we found that powered by JotForm with a link um, that works the best for us. Um, I, I believe we tested out like made, made by JotForm, create your own form at JotForm, but we decided on powered by JotForm and we've been tracking basically the signups and, and the active levels. But basically like the way that the JotForm pricing plan works is you move up the ladder, you pay more and more money based on your need for job form. So the more submissions you're getting, like the more you would pay. So if you're only getting you know, five submissions from your form a month, be free, we don't care. Like, um, in fact, like we, want, we want those people to do better to get more submissions so more people can see the job form branding. And if they reach a limit, they would move to be a paid user. So as far as forms, like, People send them out, people promote the job form forms. So they're doing the marketing for us as far as the, that viral loop in the product. Can I just, uh, just add a little bit to that? Um, with regards to, I understand um, how you leverage your brand and you know, in the forms to grow. Um, I was thinking it's along the line of using something makes a human psychology. So for, so for example, I'm paying, let's say, 20 bucks per month, right? And, and I want to pay, say, 15 bucks per month. Is there any incentive? For your customer to potentially bring in other customers, so that their their cost or the collective cost reduces. Kind of like how with drop, uh, I think with Dropbox, where you um, you have a double sided discount, mm -hmm. and you have you tried using something like that, and what do you think about the strategies like that? So as far as the referral cost uh, product, we don't have referrals in place, but it's a very very popular use case for creative agencies to use JobForm for their clients. So a creative agency, like advertising, web design, anything like that, can use JotForm for all their clients on, on their websites and everything like that. And then like they have a, they may pay $19 a month or whatever it may be to JotForm, but they're charging their client, they're giving a value add to their client so they can charge more money. Yeah. So they definitely have an incentive to have as much people as possible on JotForm. It looks like a future area to work on because that's a known thing. There's a certain point, point where it's cheaper for your customers to refer customers for you. And that's where like Adobe and Macromedia actually, mm -hmm. and other companies that take off at the scale level, which you're starting to get, I sound like you have seven, eight figure probably user base. You're gonna want to 
be able to start competing there like Uber and others did with their referrals. Because that takes you from like a good successful company to like we did with iTunes and Apple, we start giving away iTunes. Products. Yeah, referrals is great, but I'll also tell you a story that you might find interesting is yeah. um, we actually got a huge bump in users by something that was a combination of luck and reacting to that. So Adobe had an online forms product called Form Central, and we were swarmed with support requests one day, and then we quickly realized that, that Form Central, Adobe's product was shutting down. So this is an opportunity that, I mean, it's just luck, you can't predict it, but you can definitely think about how you would react to this kind of thing. So we reacted very quickly. We knew that they were shutting down. All of our users were, some of the users initially, you know, we're all kind of procrastinators, so we definitely had a lot of users on board in the last days of, you know, their forms were getting shut down, and they came over to us, but we actually had a six month window to acquire all of those users. So we were told in about January, February, um, that they were gonna be shut down, there was an announcement for Form Central, but the forms would be, like the product would be completely shut down that June. So lucky for us, we did have a, like about a six month window to acquire all of those users. So something that we did was we developed a import tool. Our developers are great and it was, it was really amazing to see how quickly they reacted to something like that. So we developed an import tool where people who were Form Central users could very easily just seamlessly upload their forms and not have to lose any data. And the thing with online forms is sometimes you have hundreds of forms. Sometimes each form has 100 form fields. It's very labor intensive to use it because it's, you sit down and you create it, you can spend days on it or whatever it may take, but then it just runs. So it's something that you often create one time and then you reap the rewards for a long time. So people were understandably very unhappy that this product was shutting down. So not only did we create the import tool, we had to do a full marketing campaign around that event, and that consisted of developing a landing page that would capture those users. We even, people wanted to feel comfortable about giving all of their company data over to us and having their forms like be okay. So our developers even created um, a very creative uh, visual representation of what their you know, beautiful design forms from Form Central would look like once they were imported to job form. You can actually scroll kind of like those BuzzFeed articles that shows like before and after. So you can scroll, this is my Form Central form, this is what it looks like in job form, see that it looks pretty much identical in those cases, and then that will allow them to feel more comfortable uploading. Um, and then we also did a lot of uh, marketing activities around that, but the most important thing, as you can imagine, is buy-in from Adobe itself. So we're obviously much smaller than Adobe, and finding the person that's responsible for the happiness of those users was really difficult. So we had this problem, we, we had needed to approach it somehow, so what we did was actually use LinkedIn Premium, started contacting people. Uh, it was, we knew the name of their product, we didn't personally know who was responsible, um, because it was like, the face of it was Adobe, there was no specific names, it was pretty hard. But I actually was, it was kind of a lucky break. I cold linked in, uh, messaged, I emailed somebody who happened to be the person responsible for the, for the happiness of the users, and cold emailed her, and her response was so enthusiastic, and I was very relieved. It was, it was basically summarized as, Oh, thank God, we need to do something about this. <laughs> so um, we set up a presentation. The designers, like, you know, marketers create the content, really just showcasing job form, why their users should switch over to us. Um, our designers create a presentation, and I actually, um, we had like a, a call, and I presented to her, and she was pretty receptive, and we ended up establishing some sort of a partnership. They definitely had to stay kind of neutral as far as the competitors. So, so they did. Ref they they did send people RA with a referral, but they also like had to list some of our competitors as well. But we did establish a partnership where um, we had an e-signature uh, Adobe e-signing services um, collecting signatures online that was in our product, and we were able to kind of like co-promote that. We you know job form. We were on their blog. They were on our blog, um, and we got a ton of our users. So everyone was happy. So. That was, um, that was a pretty fun product, and so what ends up happening, if you have a competitor shut down, you just need to act really quickly, and you just need to make them comfortable coming over to you with a lot of messaging, a lot of examples, and we also did a full PR campaign 
Um, so we kind of just hit them at every angle. We really like came together as a company and this was like our major product uh, project when this happened because all those users up in the air, that opportunity doesn't come around so often. So we definitely really invested in that. How did you how did you target them? We did social media targeting, we also did AdWords, and we also did um, all sorts of PR like content. So and um, our landing page actually, if you you know type in Form Central Alternative, we were number one. We optimized for SEO. We really we were everywhere. <laughs> It's funny, I don't think there's like even a name for this traction channel, right? To like go after when another company is dying. Well, not when another company is dying, but like a part of it is. And then actually like going and acquiring those users, is, that's awesome. Cool. All right, we'll take one more question. Go for it. I'm curious, um, for a product like uh, Jotform, is there, I'm sorry, is there some sort of like seasonality of people, you know, when they sign up, they think when they use it, and you take the advantage of the seasonality that's a good question. There is seasonality, as you'd imagine. So just kind of in general for B2B software products, everything kind of dies down in December. It's the holidays, people are going away, they're probably not using your product very much. Um, and we do a yearly annual sale. Um, it goes into our free users, and basically for the people who have never upgraded, who have never paid, they're our free users, there's a good chance that those people will remain free and will never upgrade. So why not give them half off an annual plan to use our product? So we always get a big spike in revenue on what would be one of the slowest times of the year because a lot of people who would have never paid anyway are suddenly paying for a year. And then we definitely want to, in general, encourage people to be on an annual plan versus the month-to-month -month subscription because the churn is lower. It's, it's also pretty psychological. If you are on a monthly subscription, you're getting a bill every month. Um, you feel like, oh, if I didn't use it last month, uh, maybe I'll just stop it. So we do, along with other uh, SaaS products, we do have that, you know, the cancellations, and they come back because people are concerned with the month to month, the usage, is it, is it worth it in January versus March? But if you have someone on an annual plan, they can relax a little bit about the usage it doesn't matter if they're barely using your product for a quarter. If they're using it extensively for the rest of the year, I mean, they've already paid for the annual plan. So be, encouraging your month-to-month -month users to go on an annual plan is really great for churn and retention. Do you have a storage thing if they switch from like a annual computer or month-to-month, they need to drop down a uh, free plan and they go back up? Do you have integration with storage partners, Box, but maybe even like cloud providers so they can always have a copy of that data? So we do integrate with Box and all that, but we actually, our product has data collection, so we do store their data. So if someone wants to um, kind of have a hiatus or a little break from our product, um, they can pay like a small fee just for us to store their data for them. Awesome, we're gonna go from there. I just wanna give a huge thank you to Liam for coming out tonight. If you guys have any questions later, uh, I'm sure she'll be here for a little bit. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask her. So again, thank you guys for coming out and I really appreciate it. Cheers.